carbon in the soil sponge with fungi with Susan Van Hook. And Sue Van Hook is a mycologist, naturalist, teacher, and healer. She has been studying the taxonomy and ecology of fungi for the past 48 years. In her retirement, although it doesn't sound like it could be a lasting retirement, <laughs> um, she consults, teaches, and writes about fungi. Sue's certification in healing touch, shamanic journeying, and active green work have brought her closer to sharing a quantum real realty with fungi. Please join me in welcoming Sue. <laughs> Is it possible to kill one bank of these lights for the slides, or why not? That's yeah. Is that better? Yeah. yeah a little better. Okay. You don't need to see me really. Um, it, that's what we're looking at. So welcome everybody. Thanks for being here this morning, and thanks for coming to this wonderful new event at um, Adirondack Experience. Um, so I, have, as Michaela said, I've been studying fungi for a very long time since 1974, um, Northern California. I grew up outside of Philadelphia. And I grew up in the woods, basically, um, and uh, I'm most comfortable there. So um, I'm a bot trained in botany in my undergraduate degree and my graduate degree is in mycology, and I studied the ecology of fungi in a sand dune system in Northern California in Arcata, um, where I went out collecting four hours a day, six days a week for two years straight. So I think that's spent more time than a lot of mycologists here have spent in the woods in two years. Um, and the reason for doing that was that. Um, I wanted to see, could we start to characterize the mushroom, uh, which is now called funga. There's flora, there's fauna, and there's now funga, just so you know, mm -hmm. mushrooms have their own term. Um, I wanted to char characterize the funga of, and to see if there are there dominant species that we always see, and ones that are more rare. And we really didn't have a really good idea about that. So for the two year study, I was able to see everybody that came up. By going there, I visited, I had three areas, I visited each one twice a week. And I also wanted to document, like, on average, how long the mushrooms stay above ground? Like, how long do they do their reproductive act, right? And the average turns out to be five or seven days, with chanterelles being more like two to three weeks as an exception. Mm -hmm. um, so they're up there for a very short period of time, and that's all that we see, mm -hmm. right? That's a really brief encounter, very ephemeral encounter. But then there's all this mm -hmm. other stuff happening with the main part of the fungus body, which is the mycelium, how many people have heard that word before? Yay! <laughs> 15 years ago, it would have been like one person. So if that word is out, that's great. And so um, if the mycelium, the underground portion, or the in the wood portion, or in your foot portion of the fungus that is the main tree, and that mushroom is just the apple on the tree. Okay, so it's just the reproductive um, unit for the, for the organism. So it turns out that most of those fungi are in the soil, right? And we've gone to space, <laughs> we've done the oceans, but we don't know very much about the soil underneath our feet. Mm -hmm. And in one cubic centimeter, one sugar cube of soil, there are average 300 species of fungi. Oh, wow. wow. And an average of eight miles of mycelium. Mm -hmm. But just plug that in there mm -hmm. as we don't know anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, there's all a new frontier. Um, so here we have some wow. quotes from um, Paul Harvey, man, despite his artistic pretensions, his sophistication, and his many accomplishments, owes his existence to a six-inch layer of topsoil, mm -hmm. right? And the fact that it rains. Mm -hmm. All of life is right there. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll point out why. And then Roosevelt, this was right uh, after the Dust Bowl, so they were in Congress, and one of the senators or representatives um, uh, just opened the curtain and said, Ladies and gentlemen, it would have been ladies and gentlemen, it would have been gentlemen, yeah. <laughs> I bring you Kansas. Mm -hmm. And it was all of the soil from Kansas blowing as far as D.C. Um, so that's Roosevelt's quote. And then um, Christine Jones is a, is a premier soil scientist right now in Australia. And she, a lot of this soil health principles work comes from Christine. Um, carbon is a currency for most transactions with and between living things. Just think about that mm -hmm. for a minute. Right. Carbon is our food, carbon is our body, mm -hmm. carbon is everything um, in life and not life. Carbon. And no more is more is just more evident in the soil. Okay, so we're going to start down this journey of the role of fungi in creating what we call the soil sponge. Right, and the soil sponge is where we need to head, folks, pretty quickly in order to survive, really. So, let's see if I can get a little thingy to receive my. 
Okay, so understanding how to play here. Um, so really all of life comes from the sun, right? Photosynthesis, right? We have the sun energy, which is a physical bombardment of photons, little particles, hitting a chlorophyll molecule in a plant leaf that's embedded in a membrane. And the membrane allows it to transfer that energy. Mm -hmm. And it, it, the, the, the chlorophyll takes the physical energy and turns it into a chemical energy, mm -hmm. right? It captures the um, photon and turns it, dislodges an electron and, and captures the, as a chemical energy. And the result of those dark reactions in photosynthesis is a sugar, right? Everybody knows glucose, everybody mm -hmm. knows glucose, mm -hmm. right? So for a second, we have to do glucose. Sorry, I'm a teacher. <laughs> I taught 20 years. <laughs> so, um, so hold up your hands, this is glucose. Mm -hmm. And you stick up your thumb, and your pointer is the number one carbon. Your pinky is the number two. Mm -hmm. Number three is your is your knuckle down here. Mm -hmm. Four, five, and number six. Okay, so there's six carbons in a ring of glucose. Every other molecule on the planet comes from here. Mm -hmm. This is the origin. We just talked about this in the words of like, wait, a proteins don't come from glucose. Like, oh yeah, they do. Lipids don't come from glucose. Oh yeah, they do. Nucleic acids, they do too. Right? We only have four categories of major molecules. Mm -hmm. Carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, your fats, and DNA, right? Nucleic acids, right? It all starts with glucose. So we have different linkages. So we have the number um, one carbon here hooked to the number four carbon, and we put both thumbs up, and we have a long chain of these, and that's starch. We can eat it, it's soft. You do potato latkes, and it all falls in the bottom of the bowl, all the starch grains, right? We can digest it. All you do is that same linkage, one, four, on glucose chain, flip every other to the thumb down, and you get cellulose. Mm -hmm. So this is alpha one, four linkage, beta one, four linkage. What does cellulose feel like? <laughs> Hard, it's trees. <laughs> it's the exoskeleton that holds up plants. Um, can we digest cellulose? No, it's fiber in our body, right? It goes right through us, right? One little tiny, change in the configuration and all of that property change from a digestible sloped molecule to an impermeable one that's got the tensile strength of steel. And that, folks, blows my mind. I would blow yours too. Um, so, so plants are doing the composition of life through photosynthesis. And let's just clarify this new carbon language that's floating around in the media. Um, we have the word sequester. What does that mean? Store. No. <laughs> okay, that's the that's the misnomer. Sequester is very specific to photosynthesis. Only plants and a few bacteria can sequester carbon. It's it's taking it. It's the process of taking it from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere into glucose. That is sequestering it. You're pulling it from one place to another. Storage is what everything else does. So plants do store carbon in all of their tissues and their roots, particularly in their tubers, carrots and turnips and beets and other places. And we store carbon and fungi can store carbon. So that distinction is very important in, correct anybody when you hear um, they spoken because that's a big mistake that we don't understand. Um, and we have all this corporate investment going on in this carbon credit stuff that's driving me crazy. Um, <laughs> it's also undermining my um, mushroom beliefs and kelp farming, but we have to start understanding that that piece of science. So back to this is plants compose life from carbon dioxide and water in the presence of sunlight and chlorophyll, and fungi decompose life, decompose life, right? Mm -hmm. They go together, okay? This might be more trouble than it's worth. So for the chemists in the audience, how many of those do I have? Oh, yay! A few, yay! Um, this is really basic chemistry high school, uh, but we forget, right? So these are just equations for photosynthesis is six molecules of carbon dioxide plus six waters in the presence of sun and chlorophyll go to C6H12O6, which is glucose, and a byproduct is oxygen. We're breathing because it's a byproduct of photosynthesis. And the early environment was, oxygen was toxic. There was no oxygen, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so decomposition is exactly the reverse of that, and that's what fungi do. Some of the fungi, the decomposer fungi, right? Nature's recycler fungi. But just 
The circular economy of life is this. And in our system today, we talk about how many times do we hear on the radio every day? Economic growth, GDP, economic growth, GDP. That is a linear model. We are on a finite planet with only X resources, there are no more. We can't recreate them. In our linear model, we create this huge waste stream that's now trolling us, CO2 being the biggest, the biggest thorn in our side. And we've got to move to the circular economy. So the mushroom buoy is part of that. Okay. Okay, so there are, there are three ways that fungi, they can't make their own sugars from the sun, so that they have to get their carbon from somewhere else. So they do that as decomposer, we just talked about that, which is dead, orga dead organic matter. They do that as, um, as parasites or pathogens killing for their carbon, right? Any of you have ringworm in your toes, <laughs> um, that's a fungus yeah. that's eating you, um, okay, and feeding off of you. And then we have sharing carbon. So we have dead carbon, living carbon, and shared carbon. The three different ways you can get carbon, okay? Turns out that the symbiotic part of fungi is really, really way more important than we ever realized, that I certainly was taught 30 years ago. So they do this three ways. Lichens, Freddie Fungus, met Annie Alga, took a lichen tour. Have you heard the marriages on rocks? That's the way you remember lichens. There's a symbiont between a fungus and an alga. We think of the first colonizers of land out of the primordial soup of the seas, right? The first two things that move onto land. And then, um, very successful, the most highly evolved symbiotic organism we believe because a lichen doesn't look like a fungus and it doesn't look like an alga, it's a totally different form. And Dorothy Smolin um, will be leading a walk this afternoon and she's the lichen, well I know lichens too, but she knows lichens better than I do right now. Um, and she's got some displays in the display hall. Myco, rhizom, myco means fungus, rhizom means root. Fungus root relationship, whoa, big, important. So so when I was in grad school, it was like 80, 80 85, Mycorrhizae was the hot topic for research that was being funded by the forestry, U.S. Forest Service and USDA, mm -hmm. right? So we know that the fungus confers all these benefits to the plant by associating with this root. Okay, we'll get into this more. And then endophytic fungi, brand new topic in the last 20 years, actually we find fungi living in the leaves and the stems too. And bacteria are actually in the leaves that get transpired when the photo, when photosynthesis happens and releases the water vapor and those bacteria go up and they form, become the nucleus for the raindrop to form. That's all new stuff too, I'm just learning the last couple of years. Okay, but the biggest takeaway for me as a botanist is like five years ago, I learned that 40% of the sugars that plants make go to the roots to feed their fungi. That's almost half. That's how important they are. And I need to say that. <laughs> um, so this is really quickly the, glo the global carbon cycle. All I want to focus on is the imbalance. So we now know we have too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and not enough in the soil. The soil should be holding up to 70% of the carbon in the cycle. If you look at these numbers right here, uh, these are gigatons. So um, uh, I don't know how much a gigaton is, 1 billion metric tons. Okay, it's a big number. So in the soil, we have 1,580 uh, gigatons here. In the land floor, we only have 610. And in the atmosphere, this has a pointer. And in the atmosphere, we have 750. If you add 750 and 610, you get to 1360. That's less than 1580. So that's where it should be. Most of it should be in the soil. How is that going to happen? Uh, where is it that? I just talked about that. Okay, so here's where we get into the role of fungi with soil carbon and the soil sponge. Um, our agricultural practices began in the Fertile Crescent in Mesopotamia, well, a lot of years ago. Um, and we had the invention, you know, it's a big stationary, we had nomadic culture go to stationary culture and agriculture, and we started plowing. So just as bad as the combustion engine being a not so good invention, because we didn't take into, into consideration the ecological consequences. Same with plow. Turns out that plowing breaks all that eight miles of mycelia in. Oh, now we're learning. Okay, that's a lot of hundreds of years of agriculture, <laughs> right? And so our systems now are, how many of you drive 
Edward Patton, I don't know, you know, through at 90, and just see barren field after barren field after barren field after the crops have been harvested, and it just sits there all winter barren. And so it's not feeding any microbes, no bacteria, no fungi, and it's off gassing all that carbon dioxide. <coughs> all those things that were in the soil when the plants were there are now releasing it all. So really, it turned out that soil is as big an emitter, if not more of an emitter, than fossil fuel transportation emissions. Okay, Walter Yenne from Australia, who started um, Healthy Soils Australia, whose YouTube lectures are mind-bogglingly complex. He knows physics, biology, geology. Um, he's an amazing synthesizer. But I've been take, take, taking courses from him, and he claims that only 5% of our carbon problem is due to fossil fuels. So we do want to get, we do want to stop emitting, but I'm not sure it's the biggest thing we have to face right now. Anyway, so with the microbes intact in the, the roots of the plants and the, and the plants feeding the roots and we don't disturb it, we have a far greater uh, complexity in the fungi holding onto that carbon, okay? You can see the difference from five to 10% humus formation to 40 to 7%, and then root-derived carbon sequestration, which is a bad, that's bad, that's a, this is off the internet, that's bad right there. <laughs> it should be start, it should be storage. Um, 20 to 30 percent carbon loss and 60 to 80 years. So big imbalance in what the uh, is going on there. We are just going to skip that one. <laughs> um, but just to say that fungi have been on the planet. We now know a year ago I would have told you 1.7 billion years. We now know it's 2.4 billion years. The Earth is only how many years old? Four and a half billion years old. Bacteria about three and a half billion. Fungi 2.4 billion. Humans, the minute before midnight on the clock. Okay. We're just an afterthought. Okay, so this is Riney Chert um, from France where we have evidence of the hyphae. So hyphae is the name of a single fungal cell. You take a lot of hyphae together, you get a mycelium. So here you have mycelium. And then you see all these, um, you see all these round vesicles in here. These are becoming spores. Mm -hmm. This is the group of fungi that we're gonna focus on for a minute. Um, and these are endomycorrhizal fungi, meaning they live inside the plant root. We can't see them with our naked eye on the outside of the root. Um, turns out that this is called the glomeromycota, and they, this, these kind of fungi are pretty ubiquitous, so meaning that they associate with a lot of plants. Maple trees are glomeromycota uh, symbiotic, um, and uh, so are most of our crops, okay, and plants in the yard. And so in an endomycorrhizal relationship, the, the root is here. This is a um, cross section through a root. Here's the, out, the epidermis of the root, and here's the fungal hyphae. And it will come in through the cell, not between, but through the cell. And then it will branch out into this thing called an arbuscule, which is like a big piece of coral that greatly increases surface area for exchange. So the fungus is bringing in minerals from the soil, um, you know, phosphorus, nitrogen, sulfur, and it's um, bringing in water. And the plant is feeding it the sugars, feeding the sugars, the fungus in these arbuscules. Okay, they also make uh, vesicles, which are storage circles within the cells of the plant, so they can store lipids and other uh, products in there. And then, when it's time to make a spore, they wall up and form a very resistant, hard spore wall. And then these get released into the soil. We can actually sieve for soil and see these. These are pretty. Um, these are pretty large. I want to say microns. Uh, so you can actually find them. Um, okay, so this is the glomeromycota. It's a, that's, that's the mushroom right there. That's all you get in this board. There's no mushroom. And the molecule, glomalin, is what we're going to look at next. Okay, so glomalin, some people say glomalin, um, is the super molecule. <laughs> it's a glycoprotein, meaning a sure protein. And um, it's very persistent, it's very sticky, uh, and um, it's very resistant, okay? So the fungus, as you can see here, and what's stained with um, green, green fluorescent protein um, here, is making all of this glomalin that glues the mineral soil particles together. So soil is really, or dirt, is really just mineral soil, clay, sand, Silt, right? Those are just minerals. That's dirt. Soil is when you add life to the dirt, right? 
So the life, we're adding here with the fungus, it's this glomerulin molecule is gluing everything together and forming soil aggregates so that then there are air spaces in your soil and you have good aeration and you have good water infiltration versus a compact soil. And you can see in this, this part of the picture that here's the dark soil. We call it Ruana. Ruana soils look like chocolate cake, crumble like chocolate cake when you dig them up. If you have a pasture that you haven't tilled in a long time, that's what you're going to find underneath. And then the guanolin is a very reddish brown uh, color, and then you remove that, and then you were left with just the, mineral, the minerals at the end. And if you have questions along the way, please just raise your hand, shut up. I can see you all. Okay, so the guanolin. Um, is formed, eventually is formed on the outside of these hyphae, and then the hyphae die. Hyphae die, they don't live that long, constantly growing and dying. They only grow at their tips, it's the only place they grow at the very end. And it leaves this glomerulin behind for up to 50 years. 50 years. That's how important it is as a soil binder. The other part of that is it's full of carbon. That molecule is full of carbon, carbon to carbon, carbon chain. Okay. For every gram of carbon we add back into the soil by improving the microbiota, microbiota of the soil, for every gram of carbon, you can hold eight grams of water. Now plug that into the current flooding, the current fires that we're seeing out west, Midwest, right? Uh, the Paradise Fire in Paradise, California, the campfire about two or three years ago that burned down that whole canyon and destroyed that whole town. One house had a very healthy soil sponge mm -hmm. and the fire went around it. Wow. There's that much, you guys know sphagnum moss if you live up here, mm -hmm. right? You know sphagnum holds like 95% water and you can take sphagnum and regularly like pour yourself a cup of water, just squeezing it. It's very acidic <laughs> and also very antimicrobial. Um, I mean, the World War II, they packed the wounds with sphagnum because nothing would grow in there. There's no bacteria that can take that low pH of two. Um, so, uh, that's what happens in the soil sponge. It's the fungi can hold on the carbon, the carbon holds on to the water. Pretty easy equation. That's a nice little thing to remember for your dinner conversations. One gram of carbon holds eight grams of water. So really what we're doing is <coughs> trying to cool the planet with improving the water retention of the planet. And once we retain that water, then we have the water cycle back in balance. All right. So, um, all these things it does, um, you know, makes for better infiltration in the soil, it creates void spaces, holds onto the water, confers resistance, uh, bacterial resistance, um, glues soils together, keeps them from blowing away like in Kansas in the Dust Bowl. It wouldn't have happened if we had had no-till practices, we think. Um, we know that the bacteria are very, very closely affiliated with the fungi, they're all over the hyphae of the fungi. There's a um, professor whose name I'm forgetting at Rutgers University in New Jersey, uh, I watched one of his webinars two years ago, and he coined the term rhizophagy. So rhizo root phagy eating showed, this blows my mind, at the tip of the fungal hyphae, they ingest bacteria. They do not digest, they digest the, um, yeah, they digest the plasma membrane, the membrane of the bacteria. But as it moves along, the fungus keep growing, and then the bacterium is releasing this nutrient load and then it gets ejected. I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong place. These are roots, <laughs> roots. Okay, so the, the little short roots on plants are taking in the bacteria and then processing them through, letting the bacteria release their nutrient load and then they get shoved out the root hairs and back into the soil where they regrow their membrane, start the process all over again, and then it goes in this little conveyor belt thing. So he has showed this with all kinds of great imaging um, from Rutgers, just to show how everything is so quite uh, tightly interwoven. But in, there's lots of seats on this side. Just walk down in the front, I don't care. Okay, so those are endomycorrhizae. Yeah. To, to dial back a bit, you, you mentioned that, that uh, agricultural practices, uh, what is it, till, 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 tilling? Tilling. Tilling. Why, why are there advantages of tilling? Why did that become the dominant? Right. Agricultural practice. Um, yeah, because you can re you can see it more easily. I mean, it's way easier to till. <laughs> well, it's not easy to till, but after you till, you can work the soil really easily. You can also plant um, bigger scale amount of crops, right? Okay. Um, yeah. And then they keep the weeds down there too, right? And it keeps the weeds down. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. So my, my garden, I haven't tilled in two years, and I have the healthiest plants I've ever had. I just leave, I cut the weeds off. I just leave the roots intact and put feed in my roots. But in terms of commercial agriculture, that's the reason why they basically use tilling or? Yeah. Okay. You know, it was a just industrial revolution, right? I mean, there's, there's, there's Dow and DuPont who got involved after the war right. with the fertilizers, right? Yeah. We're going to make your life so much easier. We're just going to give you this bag of yeah. stuff. You're just going to go along it and dump it, right? You know, it was all, it all, it all fed into a system of scaling. It was just scaling agriculture big time. Right. Um, I was just wondering if the herbicides and the insecticides and the fungicides and things must damage Decimate this. more than it could kill it. Yes. Yeah, so you, we got caught in first we're gonna we're just gonna give you the food to feed your plants so they're gonna be so happy. Right. Well they're not. If it's, we're only giving you three things, nitrogen, phosphorus, and yeah. potassium, right? And so then the fungi are like, ah, I'm feeling a little sick. I mean the plants are a little sick here. What else are you gonna give me? And so we're like, oh, well, you're having some pest problems? Okay, now we need some pest, you know, pesticides, fungicides, insecticides, and then we have to throw that on there. So we're in this vicious cycle yeah. of needing more and more and more, and it's just spiraled out of control. Yeah. Um, okay, so rationalization, you got the, the, the population is growing so big, we have to feed so many people. I remember that was a theme. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. How are we going to feed the world? How are we going to feed, feed, feed the world? We've got to make it bigger. Mm -hmm. And it's the worst food you can eat. <laughs> now we know that, yeah. yeah. How many people of us are sick? I mean, I had, I had cancer 20, 20 years ago. Yeah, so, yeah, we have a very unhealthy population. And we know it's because our, mi our microbiome in our guts isn't coming from our plants anymore. It's all from supplements we take, right? Or probiotics that we take. Yeah. All right, so ectomycorrhizae, ecto, and, you know, endo means inner, right? And ecto means outer. So these are our fungi that affect usually just trees and shrubs, so they're woody plants. And they, they actually colonize, um, they, they form a mantle, like a, an extra coating on the outside of the short roots, and it, they penetrate between the cells, not through the cells, but between the cells and get their sugars that way. So you, we find that they, all, they secrete hormones and they actually can change the shape of the roots. And so there's a whole classification system for these kinds of mycorrhizae. And we, we come up, if you come on my walk this afternoon, you might look at some of them in the woods, they don't have to be. Uh, but they're there. Um, this was just a, a, this experiment is showed in every slide show ever here. David Reed from, from um, Britain did this study, uh, I want to say back in the 80s. Um, his book is called Mycorrhizal Symbiosis. He took pine seedlings and put them in a plexiglass arena, um, one next to the other, you know, thin plexiglass thing with soil, and grew the pine seedlings up. And then he inoculated with the fungus to get the mycorrhizal formation. And then he injected uh, radioactively labeled phosphorus, so we can trace it. Okay, so what are we looking at? So here's the pine seedling, you know, very young. Here's the brown are the pine roots. So we see one goes down here, comes up here, right? And then we see all these yellow balls. Those yellow balls are the ectomycorrhizae. That's where the fungus root connection is. And then all of this is fungus. All of this is fungus. So what does the fungus do for the root right there, physically? greatly expands the surface area for absorption. Mm -hmm. Look how much more water I can take in if I have all these little feelers out, right? This dendritic, dendritic pattern. Okay, so Charles Darwin, I do have to watch my time because I can digress really easily. Um, <laughs> Charles Darwin, I call him Chuck now. I taught, <laughs> I taught Darwin for almost 20 years as Gimler and I believed in all that stuff. But he set us up for the paradigm of everything's competing. It's competing for space, it's competing for light, it's competing for water, it's competing for minerals, compete, compete, compete. compete. Where does that end us up? At war, right? At war. Hmm. Lynn Margulis, on the other hand, how many know Lynn Margulis? Yeah, okay. Um, MIT, right? Uh, cell and the symbiotic theory, brilliant discovery, brilliant, like one of the greatest discoveries, as great as Darwin's, about how cells evolve organelles from bacteria. Um, so Lynn Margulis has been studying symbionts for a whole life, mostly uh, microbial ones, and it's still happening today. There are unicellular uh, animals in the ocean ingesting unicellular uh, algae in the ocean and still not digesting them. Ingesting but not digesting, right? So they're holding on to the powerhouses of, like if we can bring in some plant cells in our bodies, we wouldn't have to do anything, we'd just stand out in the sun, <laughs> right? So there's a lot of symbiosis there um, with algae being incorporated into sea anemones and all those things. Um, Okay, so he puts the phosphorus in here, 
and watches where it goes. Lo and behold, it's shared. The fungus is grabbing onto the phosphorus and making a sink, a bank, it's banking the phosphorus. And when the when the seedling down the road needs a little bit more, it goes, nope, okay, we're gonna go feed that one over here now. And it's distributing that phosphorus among all the pine seedlings in the forest, the plexiglass forest. So how many of you have heard or read Finding the Mother Tree? A couple, okay, you wanna add that to your list. Finding the Mother Tree, this is Suzanne Samara's work. I'm gonna to get to present with her in September. Wisconsin. I'm so excited. <laughs> um, I almost had a chance to do it three or four years ago, but um, she canceled. Um, anyway, she has shown in her research that she has traced mycorrhizal fungi from a birch root to a Douglas fir root out in British Columbia. Mm -hmm. Right? You've heard it on the news, I'm sure. Um, and I mean, she literally with a paintbrush traced these threads, right? So the only way we see these threads is when we have a, 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 a rope of like 20 to 50 high feet. And 20 to 50 hyphae you can see with your naked eye. It's called a rhizomorph. It's the highway system of the communication of the fungi underneath our feet. Okay. Um, so lo and behold, we have all this collaboration and all this cooperation, and Suzanne's work has just really emphasized that even more. So the mother trees are the big old trees in the woods, and as they're senescing, you know, they take 100 years to die, some of them, <laughs> um, they are feeding their nutrition to their own offspring, their own genetically related mm -hmm. offspring around them, but they're also sharing it with other species. So they are truly mothering the forest. And her, her work has mapped the mother trees and showed like 50, 60 connections to other trees. It's absolutely fascinating. And of course her work was ignored for 40 years, just like Lynn Mark Lewis's it was. <laughs> um, okay, David Reed. You'll see this picture everywhere. Okay, present day. I go visit my friends in Georgetown, Maine, uh, and I just got there, and they just finished tilling this whole garden. <laughs> I said, I'm a little late. <laughs> yeah. uh, and it looked beautiful, and it's so organized, and the soil was so fluffy, and you'd think, oh, there's all this good aeration in this soil. Put one step on that soil, what's gonna happen? You put one foot, and you're gonna just go and it's just all gonna compact and stay compacted, right? Whatever. This is how we garden. I've been gardening like this for years. I never have rotor till. I've always hand tilled because mine's not that big. But whatever. This is how we do it, right? And so I explained to them why they're not going to do this anymore. Um, and then we have this, which is a lot of the corn farmers are doing this. They're just cutting it off and leaving the stubble rather than tilling it in right away to leave all winter, mm -hmm. right? So that's pretty good because you're leaving the corn roots intact for a while. They're going to feed the microbes for a while. And you're on it. The soil is also code covering the soil, so you're not getting as so much off-gassing in the soil, and you're getting some decomposition and some mulching and some, some adding addition to the humus layer of the, of the soil. That's pretty good. That's like the next best thing. And then, and then there's this one. This is my friend Mark Anderson, who's one of my neighbors, mm -hmm. um, and they're planting rye. When they plant the corn, well now they plant the corn in the rye, but the first time they plant the rye with the corn, and the rye is taking longer, and so the corn comes up, mm -hmm. and after they cut the stubble, then the rye gets to go. Mm -hmm. And this rye will get to be human height, and then they'll leave it, and then the next spring, they'll, they, he's modified his equipment by himself, they'll roll the rye down, just roll it flat, mm -hmm. sorry, dead, sorry, dry, and then they just plant the corn right in there. Mm -hmm. Right? And then he's got a perennial seed bank of the rye that's just gonna keep coming up and coming up and keep coming up. Mm -hmm. Um, so he says to me, yeah, my corn doesn't look so good as everybody else's in June and July. It just, there's this little head of mine. Cause they till, they fertilize, they, but come August, come mid August, when all those fertilizers and all that nutrition is gone, the plants already use it up. And now the corn needs a lot more energy to make the corn, the actual ears of the corn. My corn looks spectacular because I have all that rotted material that's now feeding my corn. Mm -hmm. So there's a, learning curve there, right? There's a patience of, we tend to want to have a quick fix for that corn not being so good in June, July, not realizing it's going to be better off in the long run. Right? So sometimes you have to play with waiting, right? Um, okay, so that's a little bit of no-till practicing. Um, this is um, a situation. So Alan Savory is the mastermind in Africa um, who is doing so it's healthy soils. He has the Savory Institute. Um, which, and he's on TED Talks a lot too. 
it'll show you dry uh, habitat like this in Africa, which has like a few little tufts of grass, and all he does is put the animals on it. Mm -hmm. And in one season, just having the, the fertilization from the animals and their hooves a little bit forming divots and pockets for water question, in one season he can make that a grazing situation. Mm -hmm. right, so here you have one family that's not that's not tilling and not overgrazing and, and very lush. The temperature is lower on the left than the right. The right soil is going to bake hard. All the water, when it does come, is going to run off. It's not going to infiltrate. So you have all these problems with compaction and non-infiltration of the water versus um, a healthy vegetative situation um, and much happier animals. So this is what this, this is what this demonstrates in the soil simulator. So here we have um, here we have bare soil tilled left left bare soil, and then we start adding a little bit of organic matter and more mulch, more mulch, and then we add living plants. Okay. So here we put the same amount of water on all of these, and wh what runs off is most of it in this situation, and it also carries a lot of nutrients with it, right? And nothing comes infiltrated through. So that's a pretty hard, hard packed, baked soil that's going to just, the water's not ever going to get into it. If nothing's coming through. And the more organic matter you add, you get a little more water, a little more water coming through, sort of even Steven here. And then we get all the way over here, and everything infiltrates, and nothing runs off. So Hurricane Irene that came up, and Hurricane Irene split around Albany and went up to Vermont and went up to here. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, there's some interesting reasons for that, but um, but we saw the erosion that just washed roads right out. But the forest was fine, right? The forest soil didn't erode. All the places where the humans had interacted did. Okay, so that's the that's the um, lesson. And then you can do some simple tests on your own. Come on in. Um, the slate test is just you fill the jar first with water. And then you go dig up a, and you have a little either a window screen or a little um, cheesecloth and you dig up a plot of soil if you want to test your soil your actual garden soil or lawn soil and then you just lay it in there on the screen and then see what happens if there's good microbial activity you're going to get the one on the left very little shedding the glomalin is holding the soil together gluing it together and if you don't you're going to lose you're going to have erosion very simple test anyone can do and then this is a little bit more complicated in that you you um, put a two by four over here, you hammer these into the ground, they have to be even, and then you, there's a certain formula for how much water you add, but if you do the same amount of water, it, you can compare prices. And you put a plastic bag down so that you don't disturb anywhere, pour the water in, pull the plastic bag out, and then you start your start watch, stopwatch and see how, how long does it take for the water to disappear. And that, that's measuring your infiltration rate. So I've done this in places where it's taken 45 minutes, and on a really good um, stony field or organic yogurt dairy pasture down in Hoobick Falls, near where I live, it took 45 seconds. Mm -hmm. that, that pasture had never been touched for 70 years, and we dug it up and it was chocolate cake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was just gorgeous, had beautiful smell. Did you have a hand raised back there? No. Um, what about putting mulch in if you have a smaller garden? Mulching is definitely better than bare, right? Yeah, mulch, 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 very good thing to do. Yep. You're going to get decomposition going, you're going to get a lot of nutrition going back in and building organic material, the soil organic farm. Yeah. So just don't leave a bear to do that. You're going to mulch, mulch with something, right? There's lots of things you can mulch with. I collected, you know, when the um, oaks flower in the, in the spring and they drop their cackens, all the pollen cackens, they all fall to the ground, they have to sweep them up, walk the sidewalk and I rake them and I collect them in the whole neighborhood and I mulch that. All my tomatoes, they worked great. Um, Okay, so some easy tests. Um, so how do we restore it? How do we restore the situation, right? Um, we don't just go out and pour fungi. <laughs> we don't have to. Fungi are in the soil. Their spores are in the soil. We just have to treat the fungi better. I mean, I mean treat the soil better, okay? So this is Walter Yenne, who I mentioned before. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Um, I don't know who white is. Uh, a mere 2% increase in soil carbon could also a large percentage of greenhouse gas emissions going into the atmosphere. Um, and Walter Yenne says in a few decades we, we can return to 350 parts per million. So if we can pull down 2% of the carbon by just going into the no-till practices within maybe in my lifetime, if I can live another 20 years, we can do this. That's promising. I have grandchildren now, I have five, and I want them to do well. Um, Peter Donovan was one of the early pioneers in soil health um, practices. He, he 
built his house inside a school bus and drove all around the country. He's Canadian. Um, soil holds more than twice the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and vegetation. That's that first chart I showed you with the 360 versus the 1580 um, gigatons. And there's that statistic in number three. For every gram of carbon return, we can hold eight grams of water. And mycorrhizal fungi play the key storage in doing this to the balance of the carbon cycle. Okay, so the, the soil health principles are um, don't till if you can help it. Um, I haven't tilled, I said, in my little garden, and I basically have, I mulch well. I leave the roots of the crops that are in there now, I just leave the crops there, I don't pull them out, I leave them there. Um, feed the fungi as long as they can, and then I mulch on top of that. And I just scratch away the mulch and just take a little um, cultivator and I just barely scratch the surface to put my seeds in. Okay. Um, keeping the soil covered, that's another big principle. Keep the soil covered, whether it's covered with mulch or whether you uh, diversify your crops. So Gabe Brown, you may hear that name, Gabe Brown is a Kansas farmer who um, farm was going out of business and he basically had this epiphany and just said, you know, putting all this chemical stuff on my garden is not doing any good. Mm -hmm. And so he switched to doing this, and within like three years, he had health back, he had yields back, he had money get back in his pocket, and now he's teaching all over the place. He's just written a book called um, Dirt to Soil. Mm -hmm. That's the name of his book, Dirt to Soil, um, and lecturing all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just one farmer going, I'm going to change it up. And now he's getting, he's affecting all of his neighbors. Um, so biodiversity, the more diverse the plants on the top, the more diverse the fungi and bacteria on the bottom. Just guaranteed, okay? And then the really fun part is the, is the animals, the animals right? Yeah, right? Because we have been, we have been cow spirit methaned out of believing that animals are any good. No, no animals, no animals. We need animals. Animals and plants evolve together, right? Um, mob grazing was how African herds of herbivores raised because there were lions around, there were hyenas around. They kept them in a mob because that way they could protect their population, right? Then somebody could see or you know. So they moved as a mob and they moved, right? So they only were in a space for an hour or two, maybe half a day at most. And then they moved on and they didn't come back there until everything had regrown. And that's what mob grazing is about. And so it's controlling the movement of your animals on your landscape. And of course, you're not gonna do this, do this at scale. So I really believe that um, this is an island, this lower one here. He does it linearly, and some people do it uh, uh, spokes of a wheel in pie sections and move the animals that way. I have a, a, my farmer where I get all my meat is um, all grass fed. She doesn't do any grain, and her pigs are in a wheel. So they have eight, eight days of rotation to move around, and there's grass. There's not bare dirt. Normally when you see pigs, it's just bare, bare ground. Hers is not. Beautiful lush grass. Um, and the pigs are pigs I've ever seen. <laughs> I mean, they just like wobble into each other. They're just, they're just gorgeous. Um, okay, so this is Mike, uh, Michael Phillips' Mycorrhizal Planet. Just another picture of just the complexity and how everything kind of relates. Mm -hmm. If you want to go deeper, um, I'm going to skip. Well, this is another man's work. I think I have a minute. Yeah, I got 15 minutes. Um, I'm going to do questions too. This is John Kemp, who's a um, Amish guy out, he lives in um, Montana now, I think. Um, his work with plant health is just amazing. And he's got a book out and I can't remember it right now. But his company is called advancingecoag.com. And you know, I'm a botanist, I understand this. Most of photosynthesis is only 20% efficient. So he said, if we can boost that efficiency up to 60%, we can solve this really quickly. And so the 60% is making sure the plants have enough nutrition to get, get the system restored and enough water, right? And then once you, in, once you get complete photosynthesis, then you get complete proteins and lipids and other resistance. So you restore the immunity, the immune system of the plants. And then the whole system takes care of itself. So this is another whole body of work that I don't have time to get into, um, but this is basically that first that first slide of this is a negative feedback loop and this is a positive feedback loop. The more we have the bare soil, the more the temperature heats up, um, the less water we have, the less water formation we have, the more we uh, include the carbon, the more water we hold, and the more light we have. And so this is my garden. Um, it's only 10 by 20, and I've had it for 33 years now. And 
these tiles in the middle here are just the samples that we at Ecovator designed where I did some mycologists for eight years in Troy, New York. Um, these are just our, our test samples, and I just bring these home every year and use them as mulch, and they're wonderful to walk on, they're wonderful to neo on, and in four months' time, they're gone. And they just get incorporated into just decompose. Yeah. Um, so I think that's another reason why soil is very healthy. And I also use Paul Stamets um, mycorrhizal plant tablets. <coughs> You just buy a jar of them, they last a couple seasons, and you plant a tablet every 10 inches just mm -hmm. to build your mycorrhizal spore load in the mm -hmm. soil. I came home one year from a, my vacation and my garden was just ginormous. I'm like, wow, wow, those fungi tiles are really doing a good job. And then I remember like weeks later, I put those mycorrhizal tabs in there. <laughs> oh, that's probably the reason. Um, but anyway, you can, you can really restore your stuff um, going forward. And the only thought, things I have left are references. Um, a lot of them. <laughs> uh, so these are all the books I've read recently. Um, the Ecology of Hair, I've studied with Dee Dee. She started a whole new organization called um, Land Light Initiative, I think. Cows Save the Planet. Judith is a friend now. She, she lives in Bennington, Vermont. Um, oh, it's Courtney White. Yeah. Courtney White is a great writer. He's a horrible presenter, just so you know. Don't bother to go see him. <laughs> um, <laughs> Awful facts, boring, horrible. Um, here's Gabe Brown's book, uh, Growing Revolution, David Montgomery, very good book to read. Paul Stamets, My Standard Running, Peter McCoy, Radical Mycology, Jeff Goodell, The Water Will Come. Mm -hmm. He's my neighbor from Cambridge. He now lives in Saratoga, but Jeff's been, he wrote Big Coal, and he's been following the big movements. And his book, Water Will Come, is terrifying. It's about sea level rise. Mm -hmm. um, two chapters on Miami. My daughter now lives in Miami. I just was there to meet my new grandson. <laughs> so, um, Judith's second book, Reindeer Chronicles, wonderful stories from around the world, China first, India, you know, all these great 50,000 acre projects that are going on to rebuild soil health. Um, and then uh, this is a very technical book on, on mycorrhizal symbiosis. Here are the organization, Rodale, Total Carbon Coalition, Kiss the Ground, Saber Institute, Advancing Agriculture. And then there's just so many TED Talks and films now on all this stuff. Um, if you've got pictures if you want. Um, and then there's the journal articles if you want to get more attention to the original source of the information, which I'm not going to leave up there that long, and then more books. So um, there's lots out there now. This is a, this is a, well, the federal government now understands this. The new, new Inflation Reduction Act that just passed has a whole bunch about this soil regeneration. And that's a large part thanks to Shelly Pingree, who was an organic farmer living in Maine, so I know her well. Um, from North Haven Island, and she has pushed these farm bill farm regenerative practices and moving the subsidies from fossil fuels to crop soil. So we got to move those subsidies over. All right, primary on Tuesday for those who live in New York. <laughs> They're an important one. <laughs> oh, I have a gardening question. Um, like in my own garden, the soil is happy, the crops are happy, but there are these invasive, um, like morning glories that just you know, wrap themselves around everything, and I'm wondering how do you get rid of them without selling things up at the end of So that's a, that's a question I have this morning, Lori Sue. I just went to visit a permaculture farm way down East Maine in Pembroke, and um, it was strawberry harvest season. So they were taking all the berries, we picked a lot of berries, take the farmer's market, and then they sell out, and the people who still want berries came for you pick. And I was at the farm wanting to you pick all day. You couldn't even find the strawberry patch. <laughs> we have the park here in Grover Hill, and people are like, where are the strawberries? And I'm like, yeah, I had to ask myself that question too. <laughs> Being a botanist, I could recognize strawberry plants, but I had to look for them, right? If I go over the hill, it's a very large strawberry patch, probably twice the size of this room. There were so many weeds in there, vetch, um, you name it. There were lambs quarters, everything was in there. But the, And it was a dry year too, but the strawberries were like underneath it. This was like the canopy of weeds, and the strawberries were down. And if you just slightly moved them aside, oh my God, there were just like 10, 12, 15 beautiful berries. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that's the right answer. <laughs> well, I left them, but, but it does drag the taller plants. It, it, it'll yeah, drag so them down. Yeah, snip them. Snip them. Just cut them off they're to the surface. They're just, just cut them so they die back. I mean, it's, it's a lot of labor, right? So this gets to the whole scaling. Oh, there's a clock. Um, I just noticed there's a clock. <laughs> um, it's the whole issue of scaling, which I decided to take that word out of my vocabulary because I, I think scale, scaling just gets us in trouble. And we panic because we think that we have 9 billion people to feed and take care of. We have to scale, right? But no, we don't. We can take care of ourselves locally in our communities. Mm -hmm. I really think that's the model for the future is 
take care of our community. And then we get to know each other really well. We get to care for each other that way. We get to barter and we get to say, you have some, you have some scallops and I'd like to train you, trade you my shiitake mushrooms for those, right? And so that's the model that I see that's truly circular. It's an indigenous model, hello, mm -hmm. right? For 500 years, we've not been seeing it, <laughs> right? So um, think about it, but, but this idea of, of profit and maximizing and scaling is a waste stream producing thing that's not, it's kind of really yes, where we, where we need to go to solve this issue. Yeah. Did you recommend those fungal plants for waste? Yeah, you can't buy those. They're just because they were experimental from our lab. Oh, I see. I, I mean, I had a million people from the garden club saying, can we come raid the dumpster? I'm like, any comment? I go dumpster diving all the time because we chucked all those things into a composting dumpster. Um, but the other thing you mentioned, the chemical experiments, I can put them in my group. The plant pads, yep. Yeah. So it's just fungi.com. He, he grabbed that domain a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was very smart on that one. Yeah. Who's, Oh, question here first, then I'll get to you. The Australian gentleman that had the theory? Walter? Oh, Johnny. J E N E. Okay. I think it's, you don't pronounce it with J, I think it's Yenne, but oh, that's how I've heard it. Yeah. So the comment then is that the uh, NPR ran a great story this week about the silver, pa silver pasture. Silver pasture? actually allow the cows and the pigs to exist in the, in the forest. Yes. And, and everybody's back there, and the, uh, you can grow peckered cattle. Chestnuts, yes. yep, so they're reviving the chestnuts that way. Yeah, so Steve, Steve Gabriel is, <laughs> you guys are up on all the literature. <laughs> Steve Gabriel is what, just wrote the book Silver Pasture. He also wrote the book before that called Farming the Forest. So it says, I'm now president of the board at Merck Forest and Farmland Center in Rupert, Vermont. Um, and we have a hilltop, old hilltop Vermont farm. farm. We're doing maple sugaring and some forestry for, for our fuel wood for our cabins and the, the organic farming on the farm and raising now, well, we have, we have a new farm manager and she's just bringing back a lot of animals, but we have sheep and horses and one cow and chickens and pigs. And so it's, it's this blurring the, blurring the boundary between the pasture and the forest. You're blurring it. You're bringing the nut, the blueberries and the nut, hazelnuts and the things into the pasture because you know your animals can do well in there. And then you're allowing your animals into the forest to go feed on all these other things, which they did naturally, right? Pigs rooted in the forest all the time. Mm -hmm. And then a question though is that, I mean, you're talking about the care that's required, the one house that survived because it had a healthy soil. Was that intentional or was that just something that happened? I think it just happened. I think, I mean, I think those people probably understood soil health, but then I think they just lucked out. Right. So, yeah. Uh, a comment and question. I, I think scaling is the real challenge because I mean, I've had a vegetable garden my whole life and I have a 40 by 40 okay. <laughs> vegetable garden. Um, and it's, it's a fair amount of work. Mm -hmm. um, I think most of us, you know, I see a lot of people's heads nodding, etc. At the end of the day, we will go and shop in our Wegmans, <laughs> we will shop in our tops. You know, we, we will go to our supermarkets to shop. And those foods come from commercial farms. So I see it as sort of a tough nut to crack because, you know, like I said, the, the heads will go and say, yes, we agree. And then we will leave and we will shop in our supermarket. We need to die off. Your generation, <laughs> our generation needs to die off. Charlotte's, Charlotte's generation needs to take over. I mean, we have the, the only people besides retirees during COVID moving to Maine are young farmers. There's a massive, like, you know, and I'm sure the same in Vermont, I'm sure it's upstate, upstate New York. We have a lot of young people wanting to grow their own food because what they buy in the store is not so healthy, right? And they've seen their parents' health decline, right? And so they they want to get it right. I think that's one thing that's happening, unfortunately, in Maine, and it's like that I have a lot of family that lives there, including my daughter and grandchildren, and my sister, is that all these organic farmers are now being oh. revealed with the PFAS. The what? The PFAS, the, the forever chemicals. Like the PFOAs and the PFASs from uh, the perfluorocarbon fluorocarbons from the um, Teflon plastics industry. Okay. That stuff was spread on roads, it was spread on fields, and they're now finding one. They had a really hot spot in Fairhaven 
uh, not uh, Fairfield, Maine, where this young couple was farming and their well water was contaminated, they couldn't feed their kids, and nothing. They had to just abandon their whole, their whole uh, asset was gone. And now that they're doing more testing, it turns out most of the damn state. So now there's a ton of legislation and policy being developed around paying these people, you know, remediation, and then remediating it. Well, I spent all week on the phone this week with hemp remediation of PFAS. <laughs> and, um, yeah. So it's a very interesting situation we're in, but I do think that there are more people understanding the value of small scale. And I think COVID showed us we're going to lose big chunks of population in short periods of time because was, there are too many of us on the planet. Um, like we lost a million people in this country, but the rest of the world, I don't know how many millions it added up to, but it was not a billion. We need to take a few billion off. But, you know, so we're going to see more and more of that, right? We're going to see it's carrying capacity, right? If you understand ecological carrying capacity, you have carrying capacity at this level in any ecosystem, and each, each ecosystem has its own. And you're going to waver around it, and then sometimes you're going to really drop, and sometimes you know. so we're really above it right now, and we're going to we're seeing it going. Shoo, right? The Earth knows. I mean, the Earth is a healing thing, right? We're. Yeah. Well, Earth and the Earth should be fine. Yeah. It's the unit. Homo sapiens still have the problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The bacteria and the fungi are a big piece of cake. <laughs> like we got this, but you know, I'm over my time. But um, um, the fungi. Their whole stick is enzymes, right? So what they do is they secrete enzymes out this little growing tip, and they digest these big long polymers of cellulose and lignin out here and break them into small glucose, and then they can take them in. The fungi are being used for their enzymes, right? Thank and you. so we can. Thank you. We can, you're welcome. If you're going on a walk at 11:30, you want to go. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's 11:30. Great. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. So it, it, we can train fungi to digest a lot of things we don't know about, like. Toxic things too. So. You're welcome. Enjoy the rest of the day. Lots going on.